Yeah. Hercules is clear of the stern. Clear of the stern. We got a ground fault. That's probably the craft. Atalanta's in the water. Are we good to turn off? Copy Atlanta? that. Can, can we turn on the Atalanta camera? Thank you. Yeah, and turn all your sensors on. Everything going. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, we were running into that issue with um, the captioning machine, which is why I had to reset it, and that was part of our pause. Um, but Matt is here, and he might be able to help, so let me send him to you.
What's happening? I was just going to say if we wanted to turn the, the sonar on. I didn't know how to do it. Van Winch. Go ahead, Winch. Here, I'll stop five one meters. Are you ready for control? Yeah. Copy that. We're ready. You've got control. Copy. Thank you. Aloha and well done. Front row. Back row, front row. Are we uh, all clear to kick off SPL? Yeah, you can start doing it. Mahalo, Robert and Zach. Mm -hmm. and Catalina, Amber. Amazing 8 to 12 front row. A beautiful launch of ROV Hercules and Atalanta. On our sixth dive of the Ala Moana Kaiuli expedition in Papahanao Mokuakea, uh, diving an unnamed seamount tonight, headed down into the depths for some geological and biological explorations. ROV Hercules, the star, back in action. And uh, your favorite watch, the 8 to 12 watch, back in action <laughs> to, to take us down to the depths. Uh, we'll be going, let's see, about. Uh, 2,600 meters, just below 2,600 meters, and making our way back up this seamount that's uh, just about 4,000 meters above the seafloor. And um, excited for what we might find. This is, uh, we have, we've right, had I an incredibly we'll busy and exciting last four or five days. And yeah. I'm trying not to get too fast. Excited to see what happens now. I'm Daniel Kinzer, I'm Science Communication Fellow on board working on the 8 to 12 watch from Honolulu, Hawaii. And uh, back row, while front row sort of gets, gets ops in order, if you want to introduce yourselves to all our viewers online, that'd be great. Ano ai ke aloha, aloha ahi ahi kako. Good evening, everyone. O mahinaleni kavaleri ko inoa no o ahu mai ao. Um, my name is Mahina Lani Cavallari, and I'm from the island of Oahu. I'm, it's my pleasure and honor to be here with you folks as we continue our biological and uh, geological sea mount dives, Monokai dives in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Um, just really looking forward to exploring more and seeing what life and biodiversity we can see down here. Mahalo, thank you. Mahalo, Mahina. I'll pass it over to Virginia. Hello, all. I am Virginia. I am a PhD student at Florida State University. I study seamounts, especially particularly deep seamounts and the coral and sponge communities that we see there. And I'm excited to be here today. Mahalo, Virginia. It's great to be back on watch with you for our sixth dive. Over, over to our watch lead. Good evening. Uh, my name is Val Finlayson. I'm the uh, 8 to 12 watch lead, and I'm a uh, postdoc at University of Maryland specializing in uh, geochemistry, isotope geology, 
And I, I uh, work on a lot of seamounts too, just uh, not the stuff that lives on them and actually mm -hmm. literally what they're made of. So uh, we're all happy to have you here tonight. Uh, we're back in the two vehicle configuration with Herc and uh, Atalanta. And uh, we'll be uh, checking out um, the seamount pretty close to the Northwest Hawaiian Ridge for the first time. So uh, just was mapped within the last couple of days and uh, we, we found what we hope is a, a really interesting and uh, 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 hopefully spectacular uh, uh, dive plan. And uh, we're going to go take a look at what the seamount is going to give us. Oh, thank you, Dr. Val. Down to our light at the end of the line. Um, hello, everybody. Um, how's it? My name is Kukui. Um, I'm one of the data loggers on board, and I'm super stoked and happy to be here with you all, both on board and on shore. Mahalo. Mahalo, amazing back row. As always, it is uh, such an honor to uh, to learn and work with you. Uh, we had a beautiful anue anue, a beautiful rainbow blessing us just before launch of these vehicles and uh, having an outstanding day um, after a busy, busy four or five days diving the three of the aircraft carrier shipwrecks of the Battle of Midway and um, celebrating and honoring those. And I know for me, at least, I think I can speak for for most of the others as well, to coming down to witness the abundance of life we're, we're hoping and likely to find and uh, to get back get back in touch with our rock, our rock friends as well uh, is uh, something we're all looking forward to and we're glad you're joining us coming along for the ride. But uh, there would be no ride if it weren't for the incredible front row. I don't know if now is the best time, uh, but we'd love, we'd love it if they would introduce themselves as well. Uh, good evening. My name is Catalina Rubiano, and I am serving as a navigator here, um, coordinating movements between the pilots and the bridge to get the ROVs where we want them to go. Yeah, I'm Robert Waters. I'm in the Herc seat for this uh, watch, and uh, I'm OET's facilities manager and ROV engineer in our facility in San Pedro, California. Thank you, Robert. I'm Zach Gonzalez. I'm in the uh, Atalanta seat, uh, helping Robert here uh, from Houston, Texas. I've been doing ROV for a couple of years, and uh, yeah, just happy to be here. We're happy you're here, too. Amber is now an OK time. Amber Flynn, video engineer. Thank you. <laughs> she <laughs> is making it all happen, making sure our cameras are doing what they're supposed to be doing and that all of us get an incredible view of the ocean uh, as we pass through the uli, the kai uli, these uh, beautiful layers of blue that this mm -hmm. expedition is, uh, is named for. And uh, as we go traveling down with Hercules, who a number of people online have missed. Oh, uh, yes. I know no one's missed uh, Hercules more than Robert. Uh, so I, I, he's glad to have glad to I have. I was his okay with the Atlanta stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it would have been better, but. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys get a chance to see the uh, the sunset? Any part of it? A little Absolutely bit. Absolutely gorgeous this evening. Stunning yeah. sunset, almost every evening. But this uh, this seemed like extra special. Nice, beautiful clouds, beautiful colors. Calm seas. Yeah, very calm seas. We continue to be blessed by Kanaloa and mm -hmm. uh, or lucky, if that's how you like to think about it. Uh, mm -hmm. You can you can be wrong and think about it that way. <laughs> uh, but uh, we uh, have been incredibly blessed with with outstanding ocean conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, really, we couldn't have done the exploring that we were doing at the depths that we were doing over the last four or five days without those kinds of calm conditions. So um, right, yeah. Uh, but happy to. Uh, remain in calm seas as we dive this never before seen uh, and only recently uh, mapped in high resolution just over the last couple of days we've made several passes i know i was down in the data lab and catalina and the team down there derek were kind of showing me the ropes on uh, how they go about creating these maps wow. um, the various software and tools that they have to give us the images we need in order to be able to send hercules and atlanta down there responsibly and safely. And mm -hmm. safely. And uh, so 
Super fun. One of my favorite parts of being on board with this team is so many masters of so many different aspects of exploration. Oh, what do we have? Uh, is that another Tina 4? Yeah. Where's beautiful. Sebastian? We Sebastian. need to tell him about it. <laughs> yeah, several uh, several crew members, but especially Sebastian, just love their Tina 4s. Especially these giant ones we've been seeing a few of. Yeah, gorgeous. So on the, on the mention of maps, um, you know, you might be thinking, uh, if we only just mapped the seamount a few days ago, and like, well, actually, starting yesterday. A few uh, hours ago. Yeah, really. <laughs> my, my sense of time is a little screwy. Um, yeah, if we were all mapping it just now, how did we know it was already there? And uh, the answer to that is that uh, uh, a large portion of uh, the sea floors, um, the sea floors uh, structure, volcanoes, stuff, is uh, actually not been mapped, but we know where some features are because uh, in the 90s there was a, uh, a shuttle gravity, uh, so uh, a gravity measurement. Basically, one of the shuttles would go over and map gravity anomalies while it was orbiting the Earth, and uh, you can use uh, these tiny little changes in gravity that are related to like compositions, things, masses of things. Uh, uh, we could use that to predict the, uh, the bathymetry in some detail. So there's a little uh, blip that was very clearly a seamount in that gravity data there. We went and mapped it in higher resolution than gravity can do, and uh, we've already learned quite a bit more about its uh, uh, shape and some characteristics that um, gravity data alone won't give us. Oh, it's so, outstanding. It's incredible. Incredible it's, it's the resolution cool and uh, <laughs> happening in real time, watching right as the ship is passing over that seamount, you're watching yep. a, the topographical 3D map unfold right in front of your eyes. And, it's pretty cool, isn't um, it? Editing outliers and things on the fly but as, we're, as we're almost as right as we're moving along. So. Uh, it's a pretty powerful tool, um, great for dive planning, but also gives us so much information in its own right about uh, about the structures and some of the story. Um, and then the ROVs just help us paint an even richer picture, an even more detailed picture mm -hmm. of these seamounts. So uh, great technologies working in tandem with incredible crew and a lot of knowledge uh, and, and a lot of learning, uh, problem solving, troubleshooting all the time. And uh, so far things are off to a nice smooth start on our sixth dive. Yeah. It's really hard to believe, actually. I believe today's uh, September 14th, is that right? Something like that. Yeah. Oh my goodness, so September 14th, and 13th. that basically puts us at halfway, mm -hmm. halfway oh marker God. of this uh, incredible Ala yeah. Moana Coyote Ah, September expedition. 13th. 13th today, good. Yeah, no, all of our time we've is a little another, screwy right now. another day. <laughs> today's only player. Wednesday. Okay. As, as we've said before, um, being at sea can be kind of like dreaming in a lot of ways. <laughs> and, uh, Sometimes, sometimes you wake up and you don't know what day it is. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in Papahanao Mokoakea, it's yeah. uh, it's a different dimension. But uh, we're it's it pretty real out here. So privileged, so privileged to be in this sacred <laughs> space and um, be with sacred friends and crewmates and colleagues, uh, building relationships, not only deep relationships with the ocean and and deeper uh, understanding of ourselves, but incredible friendships uh, with crew and and all Very. of you who are tuning in online. We absolutely yeah. love it. We appreciate those of you who keep coming back, sharing your knowledge, sharing your stories, mm -hmm. um, asking and answering questions. Uh, it's incredibly helpful to have you as part of our exploration team here on Exploration Vessel Nautilus. And we hope uh, many of you will stay tuned in throughout the night. It should be uh, should be an incredible dive today. Yeah, we, we, we were talking over uh, potential uh, routes down in the data lab um, uh, before dinner and uh, yeah, this one has some interesting features, including a very arcuate, uh, very sharp cliff-like uh, 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 flank on it. Mahina and, and I were commenting on these incredible faces. It's uh, and it looks what? like that might be part of a uh, uh, very clear collapse structure on the flank of this oh. seamount. So maybe something per uh, potentially related to Gio formation. Okay. And uh, if you don't know what a Gio is, uh, that's a it's it's one subtype of seamount that. Um, has a flat top to it mm -hmm. and some very steep sides. So it gives it a very distinctive uh, profile and cross section. So along this collapse area, we're gonna go partly, partway up a ridge. Um, we're gonna, and then we're gonna uh, kind of lateral over into the scoop shaped uh, uh, wall. And as we go up slope, we're gonna be uh, getting a lot of imagery, hopefully of uh, some uh, internals of this uh, volcano, wow. which I'm always a fan of seeing. Well, so of maybe we'll get lucky and see some of that tonight. And then we're gonna, um, uh, the later portions of the dive are going to pick up a ridge again, and we'll get onto the flat top of the skio, 
uh, where we are uh, hoping to find a very different environment that might be a uh, 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 place to find fish. And, uh, when, and I'll let Virginia talk about this a little bit more, but um, this is also a site where uh, we know some uh, trawling has taken place in the past, oh, and yeah. we want to learn a little bit more about that. It's almost so. like, uh, who, who did this dive plan? Is it uh, Dr. Val or is it Alex Honnold, the world-class rock climber? It's like, wow, we're really taking Hercules up this incredible rock face. So, hey. in for a little adventure tonight, it sounds like. Hey, at least Herc doesn't need climbing shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Virginia, tell us more. What are, we, what are we hoping to find out up on this keel? Yeah, so, um, unfortunately in this area, there has been, in the entire, like, um, for, sorry, in a large portion of the monument, as well as um, outside of the monument, there is fishing pressure. So mm -hmm. some of that can be trawling, also longlining, gillnet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in the 60s, there happened to be um, uh, trawling that targeted corals. And there's also a high fishing pressure that targeted a couple different fish species. Um, but seem to be um, on several of the seamounts, like pretty near here. Um, and so there's been a lot of research going on recently looking at the significant adverse impacts of that trawling, the long lasting history, um, as well as some of the potential recovery that's happened because one of the really amazing things about this monument as well as the um, exclusive economic zone is that it, it pushes out that fishing to outside of this region and so there's actually been some time potentially for recovery here as well from those impacts and so um, you know but one of the issues is that you know there is very little documentation about the amount of fishing that happened in this area or exactly where it happened um, they think it's actually some of the highest um, tonnage ever removed from seamounts was actually in some of the areas wow. directly adjacent to here. Yes. Wow. Can Holy you, cow. Um, can you describe Virginia, mm -hmm. you know, for, for viewers who are trying to imagine, okay, maybe they've never been on top of a gill with us, uh, with, with Hercules and, uh, but you know, and maybe they have, but, but hmm. we don't often see a lot of evidence of trolling damage on a number of other explorations, at least ones that I've tuned into, um, and this sort of evidence of potential evidence of recovery. Again, we don't know what we're gonna find. This is exploration. We've never seen the seamount before, but if we, if we did see what might be evidence of the impacts of trolling and recovery from that, what would, we, what would be some guesses as to some of the things we might see? Yeah, so one of the key things that actually several papers have, have found um, specifically that significant adverse impact um, paper that's from within this area is there are these physical trawl scars that are left mm -hmm. on the seamount. Um, you know, some of the tools that are used are very heavy um, and they, they can be on the seafloor and leave kind of gouges. Um, they also use um, these are weights on uh, attached to nets. That, some of uh, them are, yeah, them. some of them are weights attached to nets. Um, you know, when I was working in Alaska, they had these, what they would call doors that kept the mm -hmm. net open. Oh. Um, and that can scrape against the seafloor. I'm not entirely positive what gear they were using mm -hmm. here. Um, I know some people who do know that, but... Um, do we know um, what species they would have been uh, trawling for? What would they ho would yeah, have been hoping to catch? You know, I remember that there was... Um, I think recently it's been um, Armorhead um, and um, uh, I think Alfonsino. Okay. Are these like yeah. high, high, you know, high market value fish, or is this They're like what you good. eat at fish fillet, like yeah, uh, or no, like uh, fillet of fish? At you McDonald's. know, uh, it's interesting. I'm not positive. I think you can find. Um, you know, you can find, there are markets for both of them, right? Okay. But one of the biggest things that was also in the area um, was uh, for those precious corals. It's one, one of the reasons mm. why they're called precious is because um, there was actually a trade, uh, there was a demand for them. Um, that might not be within the depth range of the seamount we're going to today, but there is still active trawling for Alfonsino and, um, and um, uh, armor head oh, on some of the western seamounts. Is there any way, we, if we do come across any sort of trailing, uh, tr sorry, trawling track, mm -hmm. I can talk, um, 
Are we going to be, does that give you any clues with the marks left behind what sort of equipment might have been used? Sort of like the yeah. animal trackway? Yeah, you can kind of tell, um, you know, sort of the, the amount of scarring, the type of scarring um, that you see. You can tell a little bit about it. Um, I haven't really delved into specific differences, um, but it also, but the other thing too is also depends on the angle that you're looking at. So it can kind of be difficult to tell if like this is damage from some of the gear or damage from, you know, um, what aspect of it. Um, uh, but it is pretty, you know, especially if you're on some of the carbonate patches, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty clear that you've just got this like scrape um, and they can kind of bounce sometimes too. So sometimes mm -hmm. there's like, you know, gaps in it, but um, yeah. Um, but in that paper that I mentioned, there's actually, there will be these trawl scars, but then there will be, you can see corals growing in between the scars as well. Sure, so, sure. you know, just because there has been trawling and there has been disturbance does not actually mean that there's nothing here anymore. Right. Um, it's something that, um, you know, on shorter time scales, you know, there's been little sign of recovery, but the fact that there, you know, this is a very, this has historically been a heavily impacted area. Um, but you know, we're playing the long game. Papahanaumokuakea mm -hmm. Marine National Monument is uh, under consideration for designation as a mm -hmm. sanctuary, right. which gives it even further protection. So we hope exactly. that, you know, looking ahead several generations, we hope that uh, uh, by keeping these seamounts uh, largely untouched, um, studied, maybe continue to be studied, but untouched by uh, you know commercial operations and so on. We'll, or, or hope. I, I hope if we do find evidence of trawling, what I hope we see is uh, just the beginnings of life yeah. uh, coming back, and, and that yeah. is, made, is a hopeful, hopeful sign. Super, super interesting, and and hopefully, uh, especially after our our time on these shipwrecks over the last uh, four or five days, I'm uh, I'm hoping for for. Uh, more life than uh, than damage. Yes. Uh, yes. Just for yeah. just for my heart. I know many of you have been following along with mm -hmm. us online, and all of us in the control van certainly on all watches, mm -hmm. deeply impacted by uh, just the heaviness, the weight mm -hmm. of uh, the exploration that was conducted over the last five days around uh, the Battle of Midway sites, and and uh, this is uh, what I hope is a healing dive. So even mm -hmm. if we see scars, I, I hope right. we uh, I hope we see the the, the ocean healing. Um, if the ocean is healing, we're healing, and uh, that's, uh, that's what I'm hoping to see anyway. Yeah, Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it should be interesting, you know, there's uh, evidence of, of trawling can come, and, and fishing can come in multiple forms, but I think the trawl scars are the most long-lasting, but there's also the net gear, um, netting and gear and such, but... Um, Do you think we'll see any gear potentially up there? Oh, I mean, I think there's gear everywhere in this area, to be honest. We've seen, yeah, we saw gear, see it on, on every on, dive. I think, on Ludon and King George. So okay, I'm just not sure if we're going to expect more here, I'm just thinking out of uh, safety of the uh, vehicles. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I won't lie, looking for lines and things, that's something that I just, I, I always do because we yeah. ran into issues with it previously. Um, uh, yeah. Um, okay. I mean, I, I, I think it's, I think that is a uh, potential hazard every everywhere you go. Unfortunately, it is unfortunately um, on all these areas. So it's um, yeah. Well, we'll keep eyes peeled for mm -hmm. potentially higher density of of uh, things like that right. as we're moving right. along. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Last thing we need is to get caught in something. Oh, absolutely no. I mean, and that doesn't taste very good. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things though. Is that's one of the reasons why you do have so many screens around you. Um, yeah. And why it's. Uh, you know, it's good to be checking them um, mm -hmm. for, Kukui, for just uh, that sort of thing. If I can, Kukui, Kukui and, and Mahina, you know, we're traveling. Uh, uh, Dr. Val was showing me earlier where on the map we're exploring the seamount, and it's the furthest mm -hmm. reaches of Papahanaumokuakea. These are the, uh, this is the oldest, most mm -hmm. foundational parts of our Hawaiian Islands, mm -hmm. yeah, um, our Paiaina. Um, here in Hawaii, and just wondering, you know, as as Kanako Eevee, as a wonderful stewards uh, of the ocean and the land at home and the, and mm -hmm. the culture, uh, just how you two are are feeling about uh, the sixth dive in the Ala Awana Kaiuli expedition. How's it feeling, Kukui? I know you're busy typing away, but <laughs> we want to hear your voice. Oh, oh mahalo. Um, that that's a very deep uh, question. <laughs> um, yeah, so 
just it's just, a, just the opportunity of being out here with so many amazing people on board and um, getting to be able to share with people on shore um, this very special place that we hold close and dear to our hearts and you know the places where we believe our ancestors roamed and are still here once they pass on and you know it's um it's a very beautiful and humbling thing to be here and um, like you you folks said before um, hoping this dive will be a healing dive after a couple of days of um, some intense um, some intense surveys in a very uh, especially unique place so well, yeah mahalo well said kukui mahalo mahalo kukui um, yes, just to echo that, I mean, we have had the past three archaeological dives on uh, the USS Yorktown, the Akagi, and then the Kaga. Um, they were, there was a lot of komaha, a lot of heaviness that stirred up, and uh, we were, you know, on the bottom of the seafloor for hours through multiple watches. All of our folks, um, on Nautilus, and then we even had shore support scientists, uh, folks who were staying up through the night and just watching very closely so they can help guide us through those dives, narrate, comment, share their ike, their knowledge, and their mana'o, their thoughts. Um, it was really grateful, it was very humbling, and you know, it was a, it, it's a privilege to be able to see that footage, um, but also it is um, it is somber, it's it's terribly sad um, and tragic what had happened and to kind of look up and see on all of these screens there's just a haunting image or an eerie uh, ghost ship at the bottom of the ocean. I mean, knowing that there's such sacrifice um, and also life and celebration at one point in time, uh, I am really looking forward to learning more um, about this next dive and just seeing what the abundance is here too. All of the abundance shared uh, by Kanaloa, our deity, our god of the sea, and Papahanaumokuakea in this realm of Po, in this realm beyond, um, in this realm of our ancestors. Because we have seen such great abundance before on our previous dives um, prior to going into our archaeological dives. So I think we're kind of shifting into a different direction and I'm just really looking forward to all of the healing that will take place. And I do hope to see if we do end up viewing any trawl uh, scars, that there is life, um, the resilience of the marine, of any marine life. But Aye. I'm looking forward to it. Mahalo, Dan. Oh, mahalo, Mahina. We'll be, we'll be traveling, uh, the uh, deep sea travelers led by Hercules and mm -hmm. Atalanta and our Herc pilot. Robert Waters and Atlanta pilot Zach Gonzalez will uh, be traveling from about 2,665 meters depth uh, along that incredible dive plan that Dr. Val laid out for us earlier up a, up a narrow ridge and uh, uh, along the wall of, of some kind of a massive slide or, or caldera or a, some sort know. of underwater poly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> underwater poly, that's right. Uh, mm -hmm. Beautiful <laughs> cliff. And then up to the top of that gyo around uh, a thousand meters or or maybe 800 meters so we're making a, a pretty significant climb climb of over a mile change in in, uh, in elevation um, just looking forward to all the different habitats and ecosystems and conditions we might find out there um, yeah i suspect the the trawling would the, the most likely place to find evidence of that would probably be closer to the summit a little bit later in the dive the dive will be roughly 20 hours in length. Um, that's at least the plan. We'll see how that goes. And uh, yeah, we look forward to uh, people tuning in. And we have an interesting question. Robert, I don't know if you have time to answer it, but uh, someone wants to know if Hercules going on this adventure has any kind of defense system. I don't know what he would be defending against, but uh, uh, maybe they're just caught up in our, uh, our World War II dive still and wondering if Hercules is armed. Uh, some of those, uh, some of those fishing lines. <laughs> yeah, I might need defense against those. Yep. Yeah. So we do have a knife aboard. <laughs> <laughs> just in case one of those lines tries to snag us. Yeah, so you can just, you can see the. 
can cut himself free. Oh, thanks, right. Robert's bringing it into view. Right there. For those of you, <laughs> we have lots of tools, lots of uh, high-tech equipment on board, but also so sometimes just a good old-fashioned knife. Lines. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Robert, for that. Robert, have you had to use that before while you were piloting? That particular knife is new, but yeah, <laughs> we've had to use the knife a few times. <laughs> um, I like to tell a story about actually about something like that. Um, yeah. It's not ROV related, but it's diver related, uh, saturation diver. Uh, there's a video going around. You can find it probably somewhere. And there was a diver. Um, I think he was 300 feet, 400 feet, or something like that. Bottom. And uh, you, you just see uh, him just doing whatever, welding or whatever. And also, out of nowhere, you see a swordfish nail um, go right through his uh, tether for uh, yeah, his ooh. breathing apparatus. <laughs> and you just see air just blowing out from the back of his head. Oh my gosh. It, it was just. That's not good. It's somewhere <laughs> online. You can find it. But it's, it's, it's one of the crazier ones I've seen. Uh, saturation divers are, you know, they're, they're, they're breeding themselves. Oh, they're, I love that. So you the, so the knife you're referring to is the swordfish in this instance. Yeah, That's exactly. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And I've heard stories. I don't know if it's true, but I've heard stories from different saturation divers when I was at another company. Um, they would always tell me that certain areas were, were in fact, shark infected. And they did have to have actual, like, someone there with a <laughs> with a spear band gun and just <laughs> protect the divers doing from whatever oh my from gosh those sharks. i don't know if it's true it might be but you know another who knows? <laughs> we did have uh we did have a beautiful encounter a very peaceful one uh encounter with uh, unidentified shark species last night here on board the nautilus when we're we're sitting out um especially when we're holding station or moving kind of slowly uh and the back deck lights are on we we operate a little bit like a fish aggregating device <laughs> or a fad and uh, so we saw some squid and we were able to see yeah. a fairly large shark uh, kind of circling the back deck wondering if there was going to be any food showing up in the lights that we were shining into the water so you said possibly something like a mako or similar we were guessing yeah we had a few guesses and hypotheses mako was one others thought oh maybe galapagos shark although they were estimating its length at uh, you know somewhere between two and three meters as long as you know, eight to ten feet so wow. uh, not a tiger shark it didn't have the sort of classic uh, striping patterns along the back or that very square um, muzzle and nose um, mm. but uh, jaws but yeah, still so exciting that uh, Kanaloa revealing himself in so many ways yes. uh, while we're out here, both to the ROVs in the deep sea, but also to us at the surface on board the Nautilus. So hopefully we won't have to use any knives today. That's my that's my <laughs> hope. Uh, or or defend ourselves against any sharks. <laughs> Pretty sure uh, sharks won't find uh, Herc particularly tasty either. I don't no. think so. Yeah. <laughs> How were the stars last night? Oh, it was beautiful. Yeah, after after uh, watch at midnight, was able to spend a just a couple minutes up on the on the what we call the monkey deck, uh, just above the bridge, and enjoyed trying to orient myself to to the night sky. Spent ended up spending about 30 minutes there. Nearly fell asleep uh, watching the stars, which is a great way to fall asleep. But it was a little chilly. Yeah. Uh, even out here in Hawaiian waters. Some people, don't, mm -hmm. it can get cool out on the ocean at night. Yeah, we are, we're a ways north of uh, the Hawaiian <laughs> Islands right now. We are. Many people uh, might not realize we're, we're almost in tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're near the international oh, dateline. Yeah. It's not that far away. And uh, we're also nearly to the uh, U.S.-Mexico border in terms of latitude. So we're, uh, <laughs> we're pretty oh. far, pretty far <laughs> north. Yeah, you go much further north and it actually can start getting pretty chilly. Yeah. We, we had to go... Uh, because of the weather last year during 138, we had to alter our uh, plans and uh, transit north and actually out of the monument for a while with permission from uh, uh, the Papa Hanau folks, uh, Papa Hanau Mokuakea folks, sorry. Um, yeah, so we, we got up, uh, I don't know, probably 100, 200 clicks or so further north of here and uh, uh, it got chilly. Mm -hmm. We actually had to turn the heat on in the ship for a night. <laughs> yeah. Which... That was a first for me on any that's, expedition that's I've been on. That's pretty surprising, yeah. Yeah, it was like 50-something outside, so it was yeah, not bad, but it definitely needed a layer up. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Well, we were talking about taking the ship to Norway at some point from some of our Norwegian friends who were tuning in on our on our last dive on, on Kaga, and uh, that would have gotten a little bit cold if we tried to transit across the, Just a across tiny the bit. Arctic. <laughs> Oh, well, you'll you'll like this, Victoria. We have uh, people excited, hoping to see some Victor Gorgia today. The, also, that Plexorid coral, this, that other purple coral, so beautiful oh, that we that saw. I'd, I'd love to see some more of that myself. Yeah. And uh, of course, the nudie brinks that many people <laughs> didn't think were nudie brinks, but of course, after closer inspection, I'm pretty sure the, the nudies, <laughs> the nudies, the nudies won. <laughs> oh, absolutely amazing. Yeah, Hercules and most of the sea creatures uh, it encounters seem to get along fairly well. We don't, a uh, number of people curious if, if uh, you know, Herc has encounters with aggressive creatures. I suppose some of those shrimp are sometimes getting a little aggressive, but they're <laughs> not causing all that much damage. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we've had incredible, you can look online, incredible highlight videos of Hercules dancing uh, in the water column with a sperm whale and Hercules... Uh, calmly interacting with a deep water six gill shark uh, some of these incredible encounters very calm and peaceful encounters um, hercules doesn't seem to, to be too much of a fan of drama Good. Uh, you know likes to likes to just kind of do his thing and just have a look and see what other people are doing just uh, watching our more than human friends down there and and rocky friends down there at the bottom of the ocean Oh, now people are wondering, when is uh, Nautilus coming to Aotearoa, coming to New Zealand? Oh, I'm not sure if there are plans, but man, what a beautiful place. It'd be awesome to explore some of the depths That's of the Tasman question. Sea. And, we yeah. may have to ask the boss. Mm -hmm. Ask the boss, get Bob on the line. Where's Allison, if you're, li if you're listening? When are we going to New Zealand? Can I get on that expedition, please? Yeah. Oh. Robert, you ever been diving down there? Any done exploring down in the far South Pacific? Uh, we have flown in and out of New Zealand, uh, and I guess we, yeah, we've. I've been to Tasmania and. Oh yeah. Oh cool. Yeah. So we have done some stuff down. That's with Jason. I yeah. I don't right. think this ship's been down there. But no. No. Mm. But Maybe one of these Robert's days. not a one ROV kind of guy. He uh, <laughs> he likes to he likes to uh, to get around and visit lots of his ROV friends and and AUV friends and and also his submersibles friends. So uh, lots of deep water exploring. Amazing for uh, such a young man. Just yeah. I think uh, barely, <laughs> barely out of his twenties. Um, Loud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but the submarine's not a very comfortable environment. So. Yeah, I, I couldn't <laughs> no, believe it. It doesn't get easier when you get older. Oh, <laughs> Robert was describing how you have to sit in Alvin, and I just said, oh, I guess uh, I'll never be an Alvin pilot. It's just uh, not in the cards for me. <laughs> you got way too much leg, yeah. <laughs> you got way too much leg. Oh, I do. I agree. My, my head agrees. You could get after in there, but... Uh, Oh. Yeah, it wouldn't be comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> After spending two weeks at sea on uh, on Nautilus, which is an incredibly roomy and uh, comfortable ship, uh, it's still not made for people who are six eight or two meters tall. So I've I'm, I've definitely lost some skin off the top of my head, and accelerating my uh, bald spot. Maybe blame Ouch. it on the Nautilus. <laughs> Oh, it's fun to be back with you guys in the van on what feels like uh, a, l a little bit more lighthearted. Still sacred, still reverent, still so privileged to be here, but a little bit more lighthearted exploration. Thank you all. This is great. It sure is. I'm hoping we get to see a Dumbo octopus at some point during this expedition. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't I, know. I don't think we've spotted one yet. Manifest yeah. it. Manifest yeah. it. Yeah. Trying. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. The yeah, other video engineer, Dave, that's his favorite. And I think <laughs> that the octopus know that because they always come and say They love hello. to show up for him. <laughs> huh? That's Watches. great. <laughs> yeah. You know, Kanaloa is, uh, he, he knows what's going on. So, yeah, there's no doubt about it. And that's one of his favorite forms. Kanaloa mm -hmm. loves showing up as he, mm -hmm. as uh, octopus or squid. And uh, they're so slippery and little tricksters. And, yeah, so it's... Uh, 
You never know. If you if you call out, if you ask for it, sometimes sometimes, sometimes you, get it. It, you just do get it. It's great. Yeah, but that's also the fun thing about doing these kinds of dives. You know, we we don't know until we get there. And yeah. there's still a lot that we don't know once we're there. <laughs> but uh yeah, it's uh you just don't know what to expect when you get on a seamount or a different part of the same seamount even. Like every single one of these dives that I've done with Nautilus has been totally unique. Yeah. yeah. You know, we often talk about uh, you know, doing some of the first dives or maybe second dives on these seamounts, but I think it's it's a little bit hard to sometimes conceive that these are massive mountains, right? Uh, 13, 14,000 feet tall from the seafloor. Um, and, we we're to, <laughs> and we're floating over it. And we're floating over it. And, you know, really, if, if you had to hike on this mountain, it would be, uh, you know, a, a couple of overnight, uh, a couple of nights uh, on the trail, and it would be an intense climb. It would be, it's such an incredible, incredible volcano that's mm -hmm. uh, that's sitting here right beneath us on board the ship and uh, and we, we just wouldn't know it's there if we didn't have some of these technologies and and now so when we go down on this dive we're doing one section one ridge line mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. one path along this mountain but really uh, really there's going to be so much left unexplored um, mm -hmm. you know so it's it's a great part about exploration and I hope if there's any young listeners out there or uh, young listeners of any age uh, that you that you realize that there's so much to explore in this life and on this beautiful planet ocean and and uh, a lot of times I think people think ah oh, they've already found everything it's not at all true <laughs> there's, there's big questions we'll there's, never find it all there's so much that's uh, that's just unknown and and yet to be discovered and um, yeah I mean, uh, we already had one tiny fun. surprise well for me tiny surprise which was uh, just the uh, the difference in uh, what the gravity data predicted for the seamount versus what we actually got from the uh, EM302, and you, and that, with the caveat that um, you can't really infer size of a structure terribly accurately from uh, gravity data, yeah. but um, it did. It, it was just kind of this the smallish blip in uh, in my maps uh, that mm -hmm. that uh, used the gravity data set, and uh, this one just ended up being considerably larger once we got some. Uh, 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 once we got some uh, more realistic data on it, like awesome. able to directly, uh, you know, ping down and get some yeah. information about uh, um, what it looks like. Yeah. And Which, that that does happen, so I shouldn't be surprised, but I'm still a little <laughs> bit surprised. <laughs> <laughs> which gravity? Which data set? Um, do you? Um. Mostly because I just have it on hand, uh, mm -hmm. Smith at Sandwell, 1997. Oh, okay. um, I, I, at some point, need to see if I can get uh, one of the latest versions from uh, Jepco, Gepco, however it's pronounced. I have uh, them, yes. Yeah. Because that's uh, what that, I was that's, using. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, that data set is updated somewhat regularly with um, ship mm -hmm. tracks that have collected actual bathymetric data. So it's, um, and, and it, get ups, it gets uh, updated every now and again. Mm -hmm. So you can get some more accurate. Um, uh, information about um, uh, some of these uh, seamounts. And right. yeah, if you're uh, fans of uh, kind of exploring around in Google Earth and you look at the ocean basins, you'll, mm -hmm. see, uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of stuff that seems a little bit out of focus or poorly resolved as far as structures go. And that's gonna be the gravity portion of that data set that hasn't been uh, uh, merged with a uh, ship data set, like a ship mm -hmm. track. Uh, but if you see little patches of seafloor, particularly around uh, some of these seamount structures, where all of a sudden the data becomes much sharper, you can actually see like fine details of those uh, seamounts, geos, whatever. Um, that's that's where you're looking at high resolution bathymetry, where somebody actually came out and uh, 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 did sonar mapping of the floor, uh, seafloor. Could have been mm -hmm. us. Could have been the Nautilus. Yeah, oh, yeah. We're, that's what we're doing out here, mm -hmm. uh, bringing high resolution mapping of the seafloor, and then. Uh, going down and, and what looked like the most interesting spots uh, and uh, <gasps> what was that? Bring Sorry, them, I am not bring them to life purple. for you. Some kind of jelly, huh? Yeah, yeah. vibrant purple. Mm -hmm. There's a great story going around. One of our expedition leaders, uh, family mem young family members, uh, uh, told Daniel, he said, Dan, I, can't, I don't want to do any more shipwreck dives. They're scary. Mm -hmm. uh, can we do more jellyfish dives? I mean, that's awesome. You know, <laughs> no, I we're trying to deliver some it. jellyfish for you. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can. Yeah, we, we just passed a thousand meters. We're uh, we're doing a great job descending. We're I'm excited because it means this watch will likely uh, 
will be on when we acquire the ridge and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, make contact with the seafloor here and all of our more than human friends and, and beautiful, beautiful rocky friends. That's <laughs> where the real science party gets going. That's where it gets going. Now we're just answering questions like, uh, have you ever uh, swam with orcas? Anybody in here? No. No? Swim Any orca me? swimmers? I won't. I won't tell my stories. I talk too much. But uh, I've seen. I've seen several, but I haven't. Yeah, swam. you got to get in the water with them. They love it, and uh, you know it helps. It helps people uh, cleanse their system as well, evacuate their system. Being in the water with the orcas. They, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a okay. Quick way. <laughs> oh, what about a giant squid? Have we encountered a giant squid? I don't know, Robert. In all your uh, deep sea. Not, not yet, no. not yet. They're, they're pretty rare, aren't they're they? Afraid, no. I'm pretty sure they're afraid of Robert. They wouldn't, no, they, they, they wouldn't mess around. He, well, they're probably afraid of Herc. It makes a lot mm -hmm. of racket. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. That's think, okay. We know, still the, love you, Hercules. The successful giant squid sightings have been where they they stay dark and then flash a, a light that like Ooh. simulates the bioluminescence. Oh, yeah. And I think they've brought them in that way. Interesting. Mm -hmm. For any of you out there trying to, to make your own home rig to, to uh, see a giant squid, you just got to uh, keep it dark. <laughs> Red lights, maybe, and just a little bit of flashing and uh, yeah. uh, a, few, uh, a few thousand meters a line, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and you'll, be, you'll be good. <laughs> Up comes a giant squid. Hope you survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, this is this is Blue Water Talk. We're uh, we're open for all kinds of questions and comments. Yeah. You have probably another hour before things get serious. So uh, and we'll be on the seafloor, um, probably losing our minds. I hope just <laughs> losing our minds, just absolutely yeah. loving what we see mm -hmm. on this beautiful volcano, this beautiful geo here in the far northwestern reaches of Papahanaumokuakea. So twice now I've got to do a dive out of, in, uh, out of Pacific Harbor in Fiji. Oh. There's a famous shark dive there. And they uh, they go out with a 55-gallon a drum of chopped up fish. Oh, no. Tuna and heads. Pre, yeah, and pre-place it in like a <laughs> rock amphitheater. <laughs> and uh, and you, you go out in the boat and they uh, they're actually chumming. <laughs> if you get on site, <laughs> nice. And there's, there's all these it. white tips just going nuts on the surface, and it's wow. everybody in. And then you, <laughs> <laughs> you get some bigger, bigger ones, big bull sharks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I got brushed by a, like a ten foot bull shark. Nice. Wow, wow and Robert. Brushed me, and the Oof. dive master was next to me with his aluminum pole that he's supposed to be <laughs> bending off the sharks with. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Well, you made him mad. He said he didn't want to. He didn't want to fend him off you. Huh? He said, Ah. I'm gonna let him have this guy, yeah. But the, yeah, the, one of the dive masters stands there and hand feeds the these sharks. Jeez. Wow. There you got bull sharks and. Uh, wow. And then, and twice we were lucky to see the a tiger shark. Oh wow! Nice. Very large tiger shark. Wow! And you know the tiger shark's coming because the bull sharks will take, take off. off. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> wow. <laughs> Dude, that's up there with skydiving. Yeah. <laughs> as far as like just ri like risk and nerves go. Yeah. I've heard about that Fiji dive, and also you know not far from just the other side of Florida, from uh, where Catalina calls home for now, is uh, some Tiger Beach and kind of an epic uh, location too for getting in the water with bull sharks, tiger sharks, hammerhead wow. sharks. So, you know. Wherever you are in the world, if you want to uh, go uh, get brushed by some giant sharks, <laughs> then, uh, you can probably make a trip. You want to be brushed by? Oh come on, Robert! You loved it. You loved it. It was just a loving brush. It was. A, yeah. it was it's a little friend. sandpapery, isn't it? Uh, it I is. Yeah, shark skin is in, is incredible texture. Yeah. Um, I was wearing a wetsuit. So. Yeah. Ah, ouch. I love that. Actually, the most dangerous thing on that dive is uh, the trevally. Oh, yeah, those yeah, guys. Because if they see your fingers, they'll, they'll go for them. Huh? They'll go yeah, for you got to keep, uh, you keep, wear gloves. Keep a fist. And you keep your, yeah, you keep your hands closed. Wow. <laughs> yeah, otherwise nobody sees your fingers. <laughs> oh, God. 
it. <laughs> they just, oh, uh, the internet just asked for an example of sampling something. That's how Trevally's sample yeah. human fingers. They uh, <laughs> nip them right off. They <laughs> right off. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They have their own sampling techniques. Uh, not that different, but uh, ours are a bit more delicate uh, with Hercules and uh, always done with respect and reverence and gratitude for what uh, Kanaloa and the ocean are revealing to us. And, uh, and aligned with uh, strict protocols uh, and uh, uh, permissions, mm -hmm. cultural protocols mm -hmm. and permissions. Uh, we, we all uh, shared an Oli uh, asking uh, for knowledge um, uh, as, we, as we sent the ROVs into the ocean this evening. And, and mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, those curious about our sampling procedures, you'll, you'll be able to watch us do quite a bit of sampling on this dive um, if you stick with us. And, uh, we're always uh, careful. It's always done skillfully. It doesn't always go exactly as planned. It's a really delicate and difficult maneuver, but uh, Robert's, uh, Robert's been sampling with Hercules for a very long time, so uh, pretty fun to watch him at it. He's a pro. And uh, yeah, what's something we might be sampling on this uh, on this dive, Dr. Val or Virginia, Kukui, what are we, what are Rocks. we hoping to bring back? Rocks. <laughs> Rocks. <laughs> yeah, you can pretty much 95% of the time, if you ask Dr. Val any question, the answer is going to be some variety of rocks. <laughs> uh, but if you're if you were with us uh, last night, you'll remember um, best-selling book. I just want to remind people, <laughs> Dr. Val and I are are, uh, are in the work. We're looking for a publisher, so if you uh, know somebody, send them our way. Isotope stories. It's going to be stories from the deep sea, deep sea volcanoes. Uh, it's going to be uh, definitely uh, a mind-blowing read. What was the, the addition that we added during breakfast today? Oh, boy. Oh, no, I don't think I can say it on SPL. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I can say it on SPL, but thank you, Amber. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, no. Oh. No, outstanding. It's, uh, as you can tell, we're, we're getting, getting excited to be exploring. It never gets old. Uh, well, maybe it does. I've, I've only done it a few times. We it doesn't to, get old. It doesn't, does it? It's just... Uh, I'm going to get old before it gets old. <laughs> <laughs> Exploring like this, going into the unknown, visiting places that have never been seen. Um, so thankful for the technology that enables us to do this and the skill and the teamwork, the collaboration. We talked about it on the shipwreck dives, but it's just as true on these geological, biological seamount dives and incredible collaboration involved. Um, amazing teamwork, outstanding leadership. We just mm -hmm. can't get over. The team is just so impressed with uh, all of our alakai, all yes. of our leaders, expedition leaders, captains, watch leads, lead scientists, mm -hmm. ROV team leads. Um, just, uh, just incredible, outstanding, outstanding crew. And yes, we can also confirm that the archaeology folks from yesterday, they got some well-deserved rest. So <laughs> they did. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they, did. they 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 spent. They they had some very very long hours with those dives, so <laughs> yes, we just we just let them sleep the, sleep that off. <laughs> oh, I, I, I was sort of uh, a bit too loud waking up this morning. Hans von Tilburg, one of our uh, marine archaeologists, who spent most of the last hundred hours uh, awake um, until he got some rest today, he just sort of looked up at me with hazy, foggy eyes. Oh, what day is it? <laughs> I said, "Go back to don't worry about it, Hans. Go back to sleep. I'm sorry. Dude. I'm sorry." <laughs> They were working hard, and, and uh, they'll be back with you guys just on the later shifts, the 12 to 4 and 4 to 8 shifts. So uh, stay tuned, and you'll have a great time exploring with the with the greatest watch of all time, but also <laughs> also the 12 to 4s and 4 to 8s. I thought we were informally the winch watch. <laughs> the winch watch. <laughs> Oh, we sort of are. Look at us. Look at us now. Yeah. No winch cam right now. That's for the Here end of the dive. Do you think they do this on purpose? They're yeah. like, uh, let's give those wackos the... the uh, <laughs> by those wackos, I mainly mean me. But, uh, yeah. No, well, actually, the winch talk is super interesting. Yeah. <laughs> sure, to us. Yeah. And some of our viewers. I hope so, yeah. A few. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is Hercules the only ROV we've got? That's a great question. We actually have two ROVs back in the water, our two system with Atalanta serving as a tow sled, be, being piloted by the amazing Zach Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have Hercules in the water. But we also have Little Hercules. We also have Argus. Um, neither of those diving with us on this expedition. Little mm -hmm. Hercules we were hoping for, but he's uh, uh, he's got a just a little bit banged up and uh, going to take him back to Honolulu and 
uh, fix them up there. Yeah, sometimes uh, Nautilus and Hui or Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution uh, work together because Hui has some uh, it's a number of uh, vehicles that they've been working on. Mm -hmm. So things like Drix or Mesobot are uh, probably some familiar names to some of our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. We are nearly to 1,300 meters. Well, I, don't, I don't remember if uh, Drix is uh, who we are not. Is that UNH? Uh, University of New Hampshire. University yeah, of New, University Hampshire. New Hampshire. Thank you for the Absolutely. correction. Yeah. I'm like, I know all these names, and <laughs> oh, crap, I can't remember which, which one's which institution. <laughs> I, I haven't worked with them enough yeah, to really have that firmly Sentry. cemented. We've had Sentry out here. Too. Ah, right. Yeah, he's on bot. Yeah, amazing fleet of robots uh, exploration happening out of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, um, also University of New Hampshire. So many organizations uh, coming, rallying to uh, help protect and understand our ocean ecosystem. This is the UN Ocean Decade. Uh, I think we've all come to the understanding around, uh, around the planet ocean that uh, it's so critical to our health, to our well-being. We're so deeply connected and tied to the ocean from the depths to the shallows, um, something island communities, Pacific peoples have known from the beginning. And, uh, and yeah, outstanding research being done. I was hearing stories earlier today of an incredible, incredible explorations uh, near Antarctica and sub-Antarctic waters. We have uh, team members who have spent so much time up in Alaska, where I believe Noah and Okeanos are now um, currently exploring uh, up in Prince William Sound. Uh, of course, there's amazing things happening over in the Atlantic as well. And uh, there's not too many parts of the world uh, Robert Waters uh, hasn't <laughs> been uh, involved in exploring the deep sea. So it's really, we're really uh, starting to rally the troops and, and uh, the peaceful troops to go out and study this ocean and using a lot more robots, a lot of cool technology to do it. And it's, uh, it's, just a, it's just so fun to be a part of it. If you're out there and you say, how do I get involved? Um, check out the Nautilus Live education page. There's uh, some great resources there on internship programs and opportunities to, to get involved with the work Ocean Exploration Trust is doing, but um, also with so many of these other organizations, many of them dear partners to Ocean Exploration Trust, all collaborating to, uh, to help us understand um, what we need to do um, to be uh, in better relationship with uh, with these and and what we love about Ocean Exploration Trust, or at least something I love about it, is understanding that 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 relationship can can and should and must um, include those people, such as Native Hawaiians and and other Pacific Island Indigenous communities that have been taking care of this ocean for um, hundreds millennia. and thousands of years, millennia, absolutely, uh, and and uh, inviting those people into leadership on wh where these technologies should be pointing their beams of light and, and their sensors and, and how we can best tell this story. So amazing to be a part of that. Well said. This is an audio slate for dive H2004. Expedition NA-154, UTC time is 07-27-30. Are any of you guys seeing that dark spot and on Mark. the end? Yes, I was Sorry. wondering about that. I think it's for the camera. I'm not sure. I've been paying attention too. I thought it was yeah. something in the distance, but I was like, uh, that's been kind of it's in been the same spot. Consistent, yeah, it's, yeah. it's been there the whole time. Something on the camera, maybe, huh? Maybe. Yeah. Or Meg. Maybe Meg. <laughs> <laughs> I got it focused just a second ago. Yeah. So it's a little, little speck. speck of something. Sorry, I was doing something over here. Uh, you're looking at yeah. which one? It's like Adelaide. right there. See it? All right, let me right near the center. Just a little bit left. See what I can do. I'm zooming in purposefully. <laughs> do you got that's windshield on. wipers on the camera? Yeah, that's on. That's on the lens. Yeah. All right. Okay. Loved being on a ship to shore earlier today with some elementary school students. Uh, we we connect live with uh, schools, communities, offices, uh, senior living facilities. Uh, Anyone who really wants to connect, you can uh, sign up for a ship to shore interaction. And we got to talk with some 
some young learners in California this morning who who wanted to know if we had seen any mermaids or if the kraken existed and uh, <laughs> I couldn't find it in me. I said, absolutely. I, almost all these things exist along a spectrum of non-existing and existing and, uh, <laughs> and uh, they, just, they just move in and out of existence. And, and, and really, that's, that's just the fundamentals of quantum physics, at least at my, uh, my idiotic level of understanding of quantum physics. And so I said, hey, this is, uh, these things exist and you'll never see them, but they exist. Yeah, they are cultural, uh, cultural zeitgeist, right? Yeah, so, so you know, maybe that's what we were looking at. It's not a speck on the, uh, on the, on the lens. <laughs> <laughs> love, love the young learners, love connecting with these future explorers, uh, current explorers. They ask great questions and had awesome insights. And it's one of the privileges of being on board Exploration Vessel Nautilus, not just hosting uh, and joining you all, listening in um, with the rest of the control van here on Science Party Line, but uh, also getting to connect with so many other explorers from across the country and around the world. So, uh, Coming up on 1,400 meters depth. All right, over halfway. Over yep, halfway we're going to be somewhere in the range of uh, 2,600 when yeah. we uh, settle on waypoint one. Okay. For a second, I thought you were going with time at 2,600, and I was like, hmm, that doesn't quite sounds work. Sounds like a new time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a new time. We're well, inventing we time here on this expedition. All the time. Yeah. Exactly one hour. Instrumentation. I feel like we've been seeing a lot more tinafores in the water column here. We well, part of that. I mean, I don't know how many times have we been descending when it's been in the evening. Oh. I'm noticing a lot of marine snow too. A lot more than usual. A lot, yeah. This is also only our third seamount dive, which I would mm -hmm. expect might be a more popular location, the seamounts, rather than those very uh, deep, sort of above the abyssal plain where we were uh, looking well, at the wrecks. Yeah, and, there is that too. And uh, so, yeah, this is uh, mm -hmm. this is good water column, good mm -hmm. habitat for uh, spotting a lot more creatures that might go uh, rest down during the day on on the uh, summit of this geo, and then uh, during the night. Uh, start creeping creeping their way up to the surface right yeah that that deal vertical migration daily um daily migration by a lot of very small i'm not and not so small um pelagic organisms is, we really are watching it they're just yeah. cruising you know we're uh, mm -hmm. we're witnessing the traffic jam the nightly traffic jam to, right. the, to the surface it's beautiful yeah it's uh, one of the largest daily migrations made. It's it's pretty phenomenal actually to see it. And so, you know, it's one of the reasons why I asked, because I couldn't remember if we descended on the, the other seamounts at night is because, you know, they, they rise up from the depths. So you would be more likely to see them. Um, but I do think this might be slightly shallower than the other two seamounts. Uh, the we top went of to? the top of it might be a little bit, but yeah. uh, it's this one's a pretty tall seamount. Mm -hmm. So it's a uh, base is at about 4,700 meters. Top is, uh, I think, eight at or the, nine the high, It's like around 800 or so mm -hmm. on top of the highest uh, little cones mm -hmm. still on it. Right. Yeah, Most of it's 4, around 800 meters. or 900. Right. Yeah, and and the the topography, the the shape of that seamount, and how it at, interacts with currents is so important for a lot of these pelagic animals. So it sure is. Yeah, you can. It's amazing how many you know local or like you know habitats there are in some you know in the pelagic space, which looks like it's all one, all one, all connected, all the same. But actually, there's a lot of variability in some of these locations, which is fascinating. Yeah, we've definitely seen that out in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I will never forget one of the dives on 138 that was just all sponges. Oh, wow. Very few of them alive. It oh, was just yeah. sponges everywhere. That's so crazy, yeah. We are, we, uh, we couldn't we are... tell what had happened there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are deeper than the twilight zone now, so uh, mm -hmm. not going to have any light um, reaching this uh, even even during the middle of the day, reaching depths like this. Um, 
I don't I don't imagine I could be wrong but uh, I think we're deep enough to say that uh, no light but a number of these organisms they like to hang out in this range or maybe a little bit deeper and and uh, as Virginia was explaining making that uh, nightly trip uh, up to the surface and uh, back down again as the as the sun starts to come up incredibly important for cycling nutrients within the ocean and uh, yeah fun to watch mm -hmm. if you get to do a black water dive highly encourage mm. that get your scuba certification and uh, jump in the very deep ocean in the middle of the night I sounds have done like a that great thing to do and it is so cool <laughs> it is super cool it's, it's, yeah. yeah i want to hear all about it because i'm looking into it yeah you should do it amber you should do it yeah. it's beautiful all these creatures that we often see from the deep they uh they come right up to you and you only have to go down you know 10 meters or so and uh uh, just uh, watch you, as it happens. Are you like clipped into a line or something? Or? Yeah, you clip it. You typically, most black water dives, you're going to clip into a line off the side of the boat so you don't really have to worry about going too deep or becoming disoriented and take a dive light. So, in my opinion, more fun to keep the dive light off and let other people's lights kind of pass through the water as you watch what's dancing around you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you end up just getting surrounded. I think I mentioned the other day I'd, I'd discovered uh, on, on a recent black water dive that. There are pelagic seahorse, pelagic seahorse that uh, mm -hmm. came up from the deep. All kinds of interesting fish, and of course, various tinafores and tunicates and uh, so siphonophores. Cool. It's really, wow. uh, really incredible experience, and can be very peaceful once you get over that initial unsettling idea that you are hovering over thousands of meters of totally <laughs> black water <laughs> in the night. But uh, once you once your breath slows down and you uh, you allow yourself to just be in that space, it almost feels like you're transported into the deep sea yourself and into another dimension. Wow. So, yeah. yeah, I loved that about scuba diving when I was doing a little bit of that during my master's program. And it was always like this, this coming back to reality. Once, uh, you know, at end of dive, you get into shore, you're walking out and all of a sudden you can just feel your legs again and the weight of the tank. <laughs> and yeah, it's like back to reality. Time flies when you're scuba diving. It's it's so much fun. Oh man, just the description of like floating out over that deep of water gave me like the heebie. Come on, <laughs> yeah, let's go. Oh. I want to do it. I want to do it. Yeah. It just gives me uh, like butterflies in your stomach kind of feeling. Yeah. Do you oh, that's dive normal. I I'm certified. Yeah. I yeah. haven't been in in a little bit, but I would love to do a black water dive. Yeah. I'd love to do it. I just wouldn't know where to do it out in Texas. Yeah. Well, just uh, stay an extra day. September yeah. 29th. Here mm -hmm. we come. Two extra days. Actually, I am. Actually, flights. I am staying for two extra days because I don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. I was going to suggest Fall Murray State Park, Zach, but that's probably a very long drive for you. And I'm not sure they would allow people to scuba dive in there anyway. Probably not. <laughs> there is a swimming place, but I don't know if they do scuba diving there. <laughs> Texas does have the flower garden banks. I don't know how, I mean, I know it's a bit mm -hmm. offshore. I don't know if they take like charters out there to they, dive. I know, because I've, I've looked into it before and they're really particular about people going out there. So okay. I, I don't know That's if they fair. actually let them, because like, I know, as bad as I say, I've had some friends that go like in the area to go fish around it, not actually in it, but you know, they go like in the outskirts of it. And even then they are like, they're getting chased off, you yeah. know, by okay. like fishing game. Cause like, they, they don't, I guess they do have you patrol it, but you know, I guess they just go by there every so often and they mm. catch them whenever they do. So, but you know, uh, I would love to go um, black water uh, diving and stuff like that. I don't have my super certification. I'd like to get my super certification too, but you know. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're in good company for dive buddies when you're ready. I know, right? That's right. I heard our southern Ca our Southern Californians were uh, starting to team up. I, we're going to have some Nautilus uh, dive parties happening uh, happening in Southern California. So be on the lookout. We'll be seeing some adventurous ocean explorers suiting up to go take on those cold waters. I'll stay in Hawaii where I can go night diving in my in my trunks. <laughs> Ooh. We've seen a couple of those in a couple of different colors. I'm not sure what they are. Are those like eggs or something? Yeah, look delicious. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I'm not sure if they're eggs. Um, I've seen some things similarly in previous dives. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not entirely certain what that is, to be honest. But I don't think it's. I don't think it's a animal, and I don't think it's eggs. Okay. I'm just gonna ask these questions because I have no idea. No, it's okay. Totally it's okay if we don't have an answer for that. Keep <laughs> totally them coming, good. Dr. Val. We have an interesting question. Uh, people curious about how much of Papa Hanaumokuakea's Marine National Monument seafloor, which most of the monument is uh, thousands of meters deep, uh, has been mapped. And uh, is, there, is there a goal to fully map the whole monument? And, and I know mm -hmm. I can say yes to that second question. I, we don't quite know how long it's going to take. Nautilus is moving on uh, after this season in, in terms of plans to continue mapping, but has gotten some excellent coverage. I know Dr. Val has been out both on the southern side of the monument, now the northern side. Uh, I didn't do the southern side. No? Nope, I was just on 138. Oh. This is uh, Rennie in the lounge. We, it's about 50% mapped. 50, uh, oh. Oh, oh, that's wow. Awesome. Everyone, thanks, Rennie. You Thank just you, heard Rennie. from Rennie in the lounge. <laughs> the legend, fifty percent mapped, and yeah. Rennie is might be responsible. Rennie, how much? Forty nine percent. We we've uh, Nautilus has mapped uh, most of the um, sea mounts on the northern side of uh, of the monument, uh, north of the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And is there a plan for who's going to pick up uh, pick up the work after uh, after we head further west? I think Okeanos might be back out here again, but a lot of what's left um, in the, in the area, um, although there are still spots here and there, um, a lot of what's left is 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 kind of the abyssal plain, like um, five thousand meters or so. 50, Nothing fun. We left we left that for we left that for whoever comes up and after <laughs> us. I like it. We, we <laughs> they did a fair stuff. bit of mapping actually. Um, uh, capstone project, I think 2017. Um, awesome. I think they were out and did some of the southern uh, seamounts below the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Oh, Rennie, we appreciate you for, for both for tuning in and also for answering questions that uh, I was only going to answer incorrectly. So <laughs> I, uh, I appreciate you. You guys are doing great. <laughs> Thanks, Rennie. <laughs> Mahalo, Rennie. Yeah, 134. Um, one of my collaborators was on. Oh, oh, oh what? boy. That's not supposed to happen. Sorry, guys. Um, that's okay. <laughs> oh, no. There we go. <laughs> that, that's a little too much information. <laughs> oh, okay. We're back. Oh, the gas. Oh, that's fine. Oh, the, I, I can't imagine what uh, sort of stories we're going to hear about that. Okay, here we go. I know, yeah. What was that all about? All, yeah, all good. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Just wanted to look at all the cameras. <laughs> yeah. I'm just all a big guy. Cameras. Sometimes I turn around and uh, just hit all the switches. I'm sorry. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a little bit clumsy. Mm -hmm. All right, just over 1,600 yeah. meters. Great. 1,000 meters to go. On the subject of seafloor mapping, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, there's an initiative called Seabed 2030. Yeah, I've heard about that. This idealistic push to match the entire <laughs> world's ocean by that year. They announced, I think we had a quarter of it done a month or so ago. Okay. So. Is there know. a plan to uh, clone Rennie and his uh, amazing <laughs> mapping team on the Nautilus? That's we, the we, real question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we might have to do that. I'll not chime in again from the lounge. Um, so we, uh, <laughs> uh, not only is Papanaumokuakea about 50% mapped, but... Um, most of the U.S. EEZ is about 50% mapped, so there's still a bit to go there. But we were working on the U.S. West Coast on towards that initiative as well. And um, anytime we do our international, you know, transits, international water, we're we're mapping as well. Rennie, uh, I know that a lot of that mapping can take place uh, as part of this broader, more specific work targeting, for example, the U.S. Exclusive Economic Zone. But ultimately. Uh, uh, who pays uh, for mapping all of the international waters, you know, falling outside the jurisdictions of, of federal agencies and, and whatnot? Nobody. Rennie and I are having a lot of fun in the lounge. <laughs> <laughs> we right now. We're both here. Um, Hi, Megan. Good Hi. to hear you, Megan. That's our um, expedition leader, Megan Cook. Hey, everybody. Um, a lot of the progress that's been made on Seabed 2030 so far has actually been in uh, data mining and mm -hmm. in 
from like private and public, you know, data sets that have been held by different universities, by different organizations, um, private companies, that the data exists in some form, but just hasn't been made publicly available at, or in the same format. So a lot of the progress has been from just collaboration and teamwork and talking to one another internationally. Then you get to that big question of like, who's gonna pay for that? And there are, uh, the Nippon Foundation and Jebco, who organized this international group, have funded expeditions. Lots of different people on it. I also have a book recommendation from one of our own Corps of Exploration members who came out as an author and sailed with us a couple of years ago. Laura, Laura Trithui just wrote a book called The Deepest Map, The High Stakes Race to Chart the World's Oceans. And it features our very own Renato Kane on page <laughs> one. Yeah. Hey, all right. Yes, There's a, a copy in the lounge and he'll sign it for you. If not, you a oh not a surprise, oh. and I wasn't at all joking about the solution being cloning Rennie. Sorry, Rennie. There could only be one Rennie. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a dramatic reading in blue water, he said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't tempt us. <laughs> oh, wow. Man, this watch just got so much better. Megan Cook, Renato, this is unreal. Thank you guys for joining us. The internet is jealous. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's only $12 on Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Virginia. Just going to jot that one down. <laughs> <laughs> Who's their publisher? We need. We're looking for one for our book. <laughs> maybe they'll. Maybe they'll want to take on isotope stories. Mm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Ooh, publisher Harper Wave. I'm sure you'd get by with something. Yeah. There you go. All right. Excellent. Pitch will be coming over shortly. <laughs> you think we can get an e-signature from Renny? <laughs> <laughs> I hear those things are selling for big money. Lots of Bitcoin on the internet. Renny's e-signature. Uh, if you're getting the digital edition, it's going to have to be e-signed. <laughs> just just under a thousand meters to go until we uh, hope to acquire the seafloor here. Mm -hmm. See, see if we can nail the landing as we have been doing so far. Mm. <laughs> I see the uh, work deck is all smiley again tonight. Mm. <laughs> as it should be. Yep. It's a beautiful evening. It was. It was. That was a really good sunset. Mm -hmm. It was almost like green flash, but uh, like the conditions looked about mm -hmm. right, except that there were some clouds right on the horizon. Mm -hmm. That is the one thing I've not seen. I've always wanted to see a green flash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've gotten lucky and gotten a few on camera, and uh, yeah, oh, they, wow. they don't happen often, but uh, yeah, you can, sometimes uh, sometimes you get lucky. Out here? Yeah. Oh. Nobody's going to believe me, but I actually did see one on Lake Superior and, uh, right. like four or five years ago, and I'd never expected <laughs> that to be something that would happen at that latitude. <laughs> You're right. I am having a hard time believing you. I saw it, and I'm having a hard time with that. <laughs> I have a picture amazing. of it somewhere. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Only time I've ever seen it up there in my life, and I've been mm -hmm. up there a lot. Mm -hmm. At least pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. 
Virginia, uh, so an interesting question coming in from some viewers online about mm -hmm. invasive species in the deep sea. Wondering if, uh, you know, we often encounter this on land. Hawaii is uh, sometimes mm -hmm. considered to be the capital of invasive species uh, in the world, uh, sadly, unfortunately. And we know that when uh, ecosystems face disturbance, uh, it kind of opens the door many times for invasive species to take hold. At least that's a big part of the story in the Hawaiian Islands. Do we see sort of similar things in the deep sea? Is this, uh, and how do we even think of invasive or native species uh, in the deep sea with so much movement and migration happening? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I've been really, I've actually been wondering that a lot because, you know, I would imagine when you're moving like trawling gear between seamounts and you know you've also got all these different ships and such moving through um but one of the things is we we're actually still sort of at an exploratory portion for a lot of the locations we're going to it's pretty rare to go back to a location multiple times um there are several like um there are several like observatories in the deep sea but i mean you, i think you can count them on one hand um in the world and so it's pretty rare to actually know exactly what species is native to that region um and so there might be someone doing that research it would be really interesting i have not heard of it um i think it could be something that we find out is occurring yeah. um this, this might be a Megan or a Rennie question, but I, I'm curious sort of when, uh, when did sort of deep sea surveys of the benthic community, biological communities, even when did we even begin that exploration to even sort of establish a baseline of what might, uh, what might characterize a native, you know, native species or invasive well, species? I know a lot of the first work was when we, when they were putting down the like transatlantic cable mm -hmm. that's when they they actually actually i think um they were picking up the cable and they were like not expecting it to have any encrusting organisms on it or anything and they were finding like brazingids and and like you know sea stars and such mm -hmm. um and that kind of there was a paradigm for a while that there was actually just nothing really that could survive at those steps yeah. um and so there is that, and then also when they would bring up like um, sounding, you know, when they when they would conduct the original soundings and bring up, yeah, depth soundings, and then they would bring up bring it back up, and they would find something, and they wouldn't really understand where that had come from as well. So, um, I can uh, I I'm not entirely positive at what time that was though. Yeah. No, it makes sense that, uh, you know, so much exploration is still happening in the deep sea. So little is characterized uh, without that, you know, we're setting the baseline with a lot of the research uh, and exploration that's happening on board the ship. So, and other ships doing similar work uh, throughout the world's oceans alongside us. So it's, uh, you know, it really is that the baseline is being set now. So this information about what's native or invasive is uh, mm -hmm. really has to be referenced from some sort of baseline. And, and that's... Uh, it's interesting that that, that work is, is seems to be just happening. Yeah, yeah it feels in, like in a lot of ways we're only just getting started with our understanding of the, uh, the Pacific as an entire system. I know there's been work done to try and figure out how uh, the uh, deep sea vent animals yeah. mm. get between the different spots because they're so far apart. And, right, yeah. And they're transient like those. That's those fascinating. Sites that you know, they come and go. Like, you get but a hot spot and it's really lively, but then it dies off and all those animals go away. Mm -hmm. right. And so dependent on the venting uh, chemicals for chemosynthesis and uh, and all the conditions associated with those vents. So that is a really fascinating question. Yeah, how are is. those creatures traveling throughout the ocean? What sort of, what, what part of their life stage allows them to sort of move through the ocean in that way? It's, uh, yeah. So they've been looking at whale falls as, you know, a potential, you know, island. Yeah. Hmm. Bouncing around from whale fall to whale fall. This is, yeah. it's, uh, that whenever, whenever that answer is, uh, fully developed, it's going to be, it's going to be a fascinating story for sure. Very. We, uh, a question came in for you. I, I, this one's probably for Robert. It doesn't say maybe Kukui. Either of you can have a shot at it. What animal is the ultimate life form? 
What an and I don't know why it has to be an animal. I might have gone with plants <laughs> or something else, but uh, I'm still gonna pick rock. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Val says rocks. Ultimate life form. Rocks. That's it. They were here first. I love it. <laughs> anyway, I'll let you guys answer that question. <laughs> you know, going off of Dr. Val, oh, you know, no. <laughs> rocks have some pretty spectacular, even like sediment cores have some pretty spectacular microorganisms that live ah. within the sediment and they uh, develop all these magnificent adaptations within their cellular structures that allow them to live at these extreme environments. So I don't pick that. Small, right. small and mighty and adaptable. It sounds like Kukui. That's our, that's our little light. That's our little light it's a good pick, Kukui. I like that. Yeah, what is it, a tardigrade? The, the one they can... Oh, tardigrade. Oh, good choice. Tardigrade, yeah. absolutely. Also known as water bears. Robert the water bear waters. I like that. Oh, that's, no. a good, that's a good nickname, actually. That's a good nickname. <laughs> <laughs> Six-time world apocalypse champions. True. Those tardigrades have some... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, even more robust than roaches. Absolutely. Which are probably one of my least favorites. <laughs> if you are just tuning in, we are um, slowly descending, approaching the uh, approaching our our uh, target depth. Uh, and about 800 more meters, about half a mile, uh, half a mile down. And um, here on the sixth dive of the Ala Amoana Kaiuli expedition okay. in Papahanaumokuakea aboard Exploration Vessel Nautilus. Thank you for tuning in on Nautilus Live. If you're over on YouTube, you're welcome to jump over to Nautilus Live, share your questions, your comments, your stories, your jokes with us, um, and we'll uh, happily be entertained and uh, might even read them on yep, the air. Yep, we, we love the, the ocean controller. jokes. We do, absolutely. We have viewers tuning in from the United States, Australia, Germany, Canada, New Zealand, Norway, Malaysia, Japan, Indonesia, Hong Kong, the UK, and more, spanning many of the world's time zones. Of course, uh, family and friends, Ohana, the Lahui, back home in the Kingdom of Hawaii, uh, also tuning in in, in these ancestral waters, these, uh, this Aina Akua, these Kapuna Islands, the Elder Islands um, of the Hawaiians and, and the Hawaiian Island chain. Such an incredible privilege to be here. Um, I know many of us just uh, just thrilled at, at, at what it means to be in this space um, and the learning that takes place in this incredible library of ocean depths of these sacred waters. Yeah, thanks for joining us. We're happy to have you. We have one vote by the internet for uh, Robert, the water bear waters as the ultimate <laughs> life form, as the ultimate life form, the perfect life form. Yeah, to be honest, I just looked it up and I am mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> right? Mind They're incredible animals. Yeah. They've survived in space. So yeah. yeah. Remarkable. Some of the facts I just learned that I'm excited about is that they they have eight lakes. <laughs> How do they have eight lakes? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's amazing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Imagine how fast you would run quickly if you had to <laughs> <laughs> oh, That means more shin splints. Oh, no! Oh, oh shin splints are the worst. <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> I'm surprised no one suggested crab. Well, that's oh. because everything eventually becomes crab. Exactly. Got to be the perfect <laughs> life form. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Everything evolves into a crab. <laughs> and nobody's sure why. Carcinization. <laughs> <laughs> One day, we will all be crab. We will be crab. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's so delicious. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Oh boy. <laughs> Wait, what are you guys looking at? <laughs> okay. I'm not minding. <laughs> we're we're looking at the Wikipedia page for tardigrades. Oh. Okay. Like, why is there a painting of a dude? It's wild. Oh boy. Oh boy. I'll go look that up later. <laughs> I accidentally thought they fashioned the wig that they use for these old-fashioned portraits after the tardigrade. Oh yeah. So that's why I was laughing. That's right. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah, I could see it. <laughs> is it just the person who like I don't know first noticed them or something yeah let's see actually no it's not it was actually um, first described uh, actually yeah it was a German zoologist Johann August Ephraim Goes um, who was the first uh, zoologist to describe them and he first called them little water bear Aww. Oh, yeah. cute. Cool. Tardigrade facts. I love it. I'm into this. I feel like I feel like tardigrades are going to need to make it into isotope stories, though. We're going to have to uh, weave them in. Uh, I imagine the size of these things. Oh, so tiny. They're tiny. tiny. Microscopic. Like, they are microscopic. Like, in order to get a really good, like, detailed image of them, you need to stick them into a secondary electron uh, microscope. Or oh, scanning electron, wow. sorry. I'm trying to mix two instruments together. Scanning electron microscope. Mm, and yeah, awesome. you get to image them that way and you get these wonderful backscatter images of them. Cute. I don't know where I got the secondary ionization from, but uh, that's 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 a type of mass spectrometer. Hmm. So, sorry about that. Oh, some deep sea love. Uh, Internet's proposing devil worms uh, hmm. as the world's perfect Deep sea animal. I gotta look this up. This double, is be wild. double worms? Devil worm. Devil is in uh, evil. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. gotcha. I have not heard. Interesting, too. They, they oh, live in yes. Hydrothermal vents. Oh. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Halicephalobus Mephisto. Mm -hmm. I like that name. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> oh, boy. Kind of looks like it reminds me of Stranger Things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the the Pompeii worms are pretty cool though, um, and actually all of those the there are snails that can can live with them too that have the like I think they have like a protect protection from the heat as well because some of those vents can be exceptionally hot. Yeah, the water coming out of those vents is hot enough to melt lead. Yeah, yeah, it's super critical. Oh my gosh. Wasn't there a snail that was discovered that had like metal fragments on it because mm -hmm. of its diet mm -hmm. or something like that? Most of those vent animals are like surviving off of bacteria or other animals that live off the bacteria. Yeah, so the one that I was thinking of, it's wild looking because it's got a completely black shell and then it's got these sort of frills coming off of it that are also black and um that's the one i think it's like metal fragments actually growing out of it or it's like yeah. some kind of like keratin that's oh like this is so i did a quick google again and it incorporates iron sulfide into its skeleton uh, see? Wow. oh that's so metal <laughs> so cyborg i love it yeah it's uh the latin name is chrysomalin squamiferum um, also known as the, also known as the scaly foot gastropod. Um, but that I, thing looks gnarly. Yeah, I found it by, um, Googling vent snail with armor, so, um, <laughs> Hey, Google yeah, comes through. It really does. That's, it's pretty cool. That's what I mean looking up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, some of the adaptations that those animals have developed is unbelievable to be able to take you know advantage of some of those resources and excuse um, me just gonna metabolize some iron for a shot right, no big <laughs> deal i'm just gonna 
Don't mind me. Slide on over, grab some of this iron. Reminds me of the, the nudie breaks that were, you were telling us about. I think, Virginia, it was you. It's, mm. uh, they'll just steal cells from other organisms and uh, incorporate them into their own right. their own bodies, including uh, algal cells like chloroplasts, and they'll be uh, yeah. you know, photosynthesizing. Yeah, I think so it was amazing. Sebastian who was so excited about it, and I, oh, he, I think right. he was telling us. Um, was but telling us. they also, several nudibranchs also um, eat coral, and yeah. then they're able to um, uh, incorporate the um, the stinging cells into their own. Um, amazing, yeah, the nematocysts. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's right. also pretty metal. Right, <laughs> it's pretty amazing, it's pretty amazing. Nature. Nature mm -hmm. is awesome. It, it is. The ocean it really is, is awesome. Absolutely love learning from, uh, you know, in, in the Hawaiian worldview, these are our kapuna. These are our elder, mm -hmm. our elders, our elder siblings, our elder family members are the ones we should be learning from, uh, tuning into, uh, incorporating their ike into our own, their knowledge into our own uh, lives and, and designs and forms. And, uh, I think we'd be on a on a good path if we uh, paid more, even closer attention to just the incredible adaptations that are surrounding us all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, about 600 meters to go. Just passing the 2,000 meter mark. This is. Uh, how are we doing? Does everything look uh, look in order up there? ROV pilots, navigator, front row. We, uh, yeah, so. yep. so far. just He's waiting for the bottom. Yeah, I've been getting the ship to kind of do a couple of little jumps to try and get us to land on station. Nice. So. But uh, on the... Target? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. On the subject of hydrothermal vents, uh, I just looked it up to confirm. So my advisor did some work down in Antarctica. I don't remember when it was, but he was on a cruise that identified a new species of crab on hydrothermal mm. vents, and oh, they, cool. called, they named it the Hoff crab after David Hasselhoff. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and oh, it has, what like, a legend. Like, we're like, we're all looking at Now three of us. Yeah, you should look it up. You should look it up. Like a Yeti crab. Yeah, kind of, yeah. Ooh. Please don't look up images of David Hasselhoff in the control. <laughs> I think it's called the Hoff. The Hoff crab. Oh my oh, gosh. Oh, that's, that's a chunky little thing. Yeah. Chunky. Chunky. <laughs> oh, that was our cute. <laughs> the Hoff crab. Hmm. Oh man. <laughs> that is like the squattest squat lobster I've <laughs> ever seen. That is cool. Yeah, actually, I think that's that white, very squat lobster. It's, it's, I think it's a Galathean. Yeah. Um, it's actually really, you, it's really interesting. Hydrothermal vents in these different regions, they have very distinct taxa on them. And so I think it, in one location, it's shrimp heavy and, and, um, it's like shrimp and, worms and another one it's some of these crabs because mm -hmm. they have the the sulfur in their the bacteria actually one of the reasons why they're so hairy is they have a bacteria bacteria um, in the hair and then you know some of the others are those um, you know it's it's really quite interesting to see the different mm -hmm. different um, taxa within the different habitats yeah, I mean, there's some hydrothermal vents uh, mm -hmm. that some scientists have named things like Shrimp City. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, very yeah. famous ones. Mm -hmm. I think that's in the Lao Basin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can't really remember. But yeah, um, easy way to remember what's there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. It's, uh, you know, they were, they were kind of, it was something that like geologists were aware of these these hot spot these these hydrothermal vents, but they hadn't really been explored until I think it was like 1970s. Um, so they've done a lot of research since then to kind of better understand these habitats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now they're um, now now people are studying how these not just what's at these habitats, but how these animals are getting, moving between these, you know, ephemeral sort of 
sometimes short-lived sites. Um, yeah, because these hydrothermal vents, uh, uh, mm -hmm. they, they can build up stories tall. Like uh, we saw some of those right. in, in the Lao Basin uh, when I was on the Falkor a number of mm -hmm. years ago. And they're, they're gorgeous, they're spectacular. And you just see all this super critical water uh, uh, you know, flowing out of different vents in these things. And mm -hmm. uh, they're so fragile. They break down and rebuild constantly. Um, you know, they start up, they shut down, like you were saying, and just, yeah, yeah. There's there's some really heterogeneous distributions of uh, uh, species among them. Mm -hmm. I've seen, you know, like thriving, like the, they, we did an IMAX movie with the submarine once at a place they call it uh, Two Worm Tour. And it was all these two worms, just huge thing. Mm. And now it's completely gone. Wow. It's just devastated nothing there. Because it just, you know, the vents just turn off and then mm. the environment, you know. Wow. Goes yeah, don't away. they don't they eventually get like choked or something? Because that uh, it's in those vents where sometimes you get some of those minerals starting to precipitate out as the water cools a tiny bit. Yeah. Oh, I have no idea. Yeah, I think the, you know the cracks move, right? They they get all clogged up, and then they yeah start venting somewhere else. Yeah, mm -hmm. in one of those Law Basin dives, we came across uh, what looked like some sort of a fault or some big structural feature uh, on one flank of one of the volcanoes we were looking at, and you could look up it and see a few old long extinct uh mineralized like clogged up necks of some old hydrothermal vents and that was the mm -hmm. only thing that was left mm -hmm. and those actually became pretty good habitat for uh several coral species right? that had colonized it mm -hmm. it's really interesting just because some of these habitats aren't you know they don't have their specialized fauna anymore they're still very they're very useful um as hard substrate for yeah. You know, some of the, some similar, you know, similar to some of these seamount actually um, habitats that we see. Um, mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's pretty interesting. It's, yeah. Um, that I'm life cycle of uh, of biodiversity in includes it's very long ranging, and so um, it it incorporates. There's a temporal scale to the biodiversity mm -hmm. at those sites, which is pretty fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Always getting something new out of something old. Right, right. Well, you've got the success. You've got the, you know, the stage when things the the site is maybe newer. Um, you know, because a lot of it has to do with the type of, um, like the the heat of the of the vent as well. And so, you know, at at the different heat levels, you'll have slightly different taxa, and um, um, and then uh, uh, like as that changes. And like passive versus more active upwelling in certain right. settings well, too. And also I th or like I diffuse and concentrated. Yeah. Right, and I think the diffuse and concentrated is really important because not not every hydrothermal vent organism can actually handle the super <laughs> intense heat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there and there's also a lot of opportunistic animals that come along and sort of live within the periphery. So it's um, they're they're pretty they're somewhat dynamic systems. Isn't, um, it, isn't it true um, that that the heat, although it is extremely hot, the water mm -hmm. that's that's venting from those that 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 heat is almost immediately dissipated, like with, uh, within under a meter of of the venting site. It's just that a couple inches. A couple really. inches, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, yeah, interesting. You got to be right at the the opening of the vent. It, it cools off really, really rapidly. Yeah, it's yeah. Ama it's amazing. All that very right. cold water under pressure, but then you have organisms that live right up next to the vent and then organisms that live, you know, further down and, and sometimes at temperatures mm -hmm. similar to the ones we find in the deep sea that are not that far away right. from these hydrothermal right. vents. But uh, Yeah, when you look for the shimmer that the, mm -hmm. that the very hot water coming out of the vents uh, will show up, like uh, when, when, you're, uh, when you're shining lights on it, you'll see actual like shimmering from uh, light distortion and that's, that's pretty limited in range. So. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That also means you're getting a lot of your mineral uh, minerals dissolved in that very hot water, uh, dropping out pretty rapidly too as it cools, and that's, that's what's part of what up builds those up towers. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We Sometimes have uh, stories tall. Those mm -hmm. on board have seen uh, seen some of the XR worlds that uh, I've been building with some young Hawaiians, some extended mm -hmm. reality, virtual reality worlds, and 
That's one of their favorite worlds. We have some 3D models of some of these hydrothermal vents. Uh, I don't that think have, I've oh, seen wow. those yet. Uh, and uh, we, we bring them into those spatial virtual reality environments and you can put in, there's also models of giant tube worms and uh, a lot of the other organisms that called that home. And I know that the, all of the young Hawaiians that were working with me just couldn't believe they could walk around and almost like <laughs> touch these giant tube worms and explore this whole ecosystem around this vent. It um, might so give them a better sense of scale than we sometimes get with those with when we dive. With the ROVs, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. true. It's, yeah. it, it, it really is helpful for that. And uh, yeah, I think it's uh, one of the potential uh, benefits of, of visualizing some of these spaces in, in, oh, in virtual totally. reality. So mm -hmm. super cool. Yeah, especially for people who are oriented toward very visual learning. That could change everything for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, you're, uh, if you're a fan, even if you don't uh, want to spend the time putting some of these uh, models together into full extended reality or virtual reality worlds. Um, if you go on Sketchfab, which is largely a free warehouse of, uh, of 3D models, there are some mm. things for sale, but you can, you can search there and find some of these hydrothermal vents and black smokers and other things that have been, been modeled. That, that's uh, cool. It's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. You can also check out the education tab of Nautilus Live for a, and see our library of Sketchfab samples that we've scanned oh, from the lab right. Right. and different things like the different manipulator jaws and claws that you can print at home and make your own. Aww. All the cool oh, 3D, awesome. learning, uh, 3D learning resources from deep sea to tools and technologies uh, on that uh, Nautilus Live education tab. So thank you, Megan, for that uh, reminder. So many cool things have inspired a lot of the work that uh, that I've been doing with young Hawaiians uh, since since first coming on board the Nautilus a year ago. So, absolutely. All right, we're getting excited. Within uh, about 400 meters of of our our target on the seafloor, uh, arriving hopefully arriving on station soon. Mm -hmm. I know we're all eager to have uh, a little bit of time here in the control van uh, while we get to uh, get to watch Hercules and Atalanta exploring this ridge line and this cliff face. Mm -hmm. Oh man, should be interesting. Well, there's a chance I might miss part of it because uh, I do go to sleep after this watch. So, mm -hmm. but I'll see what I can do. As you should. Yeah, we, sleep sleep is good, but structural geology is also pretty exciting because <laughs> you don't get to see uh, that in submarine settings as, as as frequently as you can on land. So. Ah, yeah. So I like I like cross sections yeah. and things. So what what is it that makes this exciting for you? It Have looks you like elaborated. It looks like uh, uh, where where we're doing this dive. It's kind of right on the edge of what looks like a pretty large uh, flank collapse. Um, no idea how old it is, um, but I'm mm -hmm. guessing it's it, it probably would have happened uh, uh, a long time ago. And what what exactly do you mean by flank collapse for a sea mount? Um, so what that means is uh, basically it's like a like a slump feature where a block or multiple blocks of uh, the volcanic uh, uh, structure kind of uh, just slide off along a fault line. So kind of like, like a landslide? Yeah, okay. except underwater. Yeah. And you see evidence for that um, in some other seamounts too. And uh, one example is uh, uh, just north of Oahu, you can see what looks like a rubble field. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the models to explain that is on some of the poly forming, uh, 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 some, some of the polys on that side, the, the really tall cliffs. Mm -hmm. I think, we think that uh, maybe part of the Ko'olau's um, basically slid off along this fault and uh, uh, and just may have uh, it just may have been some sort of a mass wasting event a very very long time ago mm. it, it took a chunk out of out of uh, that island much like what we might be seeing here and we don't have bathymetry um, in the northeast quadrant to see what that terrain may look like on the seafloor mm -hmm. but um, yeah I'll, I'll pull up a map of Oahu but Similar, uh, that, that slumping might be something kind of related to perhaps the uh, formation mechanism of uh, geos like this. And uh, uh, if you're just joining in with, uh, if you're just joining us, uh, uh, geo is what we're going to be exploring uh, today. And those are, um, uh, that's a term for a specific kind of uh, volcanic structure that we see uh, 
uh, all over the ocean, and it's uh, basically a, a, a seamount with a pretty flat top and then very steep uh, sides. And there, there may be some wasting or foundering that is uh, helping develop that kind of uh, morphology. And this, and the morphology of this seamount seems to be showing us a very clear example of that. So that was why I glommed onto that a little bit during the dive planning oh, meeting. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. It's very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, these, are, these are, as far as I can tell, not events that happen frequently. So it's nothing anybody really needs to worry about happening again at the seamount or really anywhere else in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be fascinating. And, and would that, would you be able to add that into some of your research initiatives? And um, possibly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it might give me better access to uh, 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 some lavas that represent the main shield stage of volcanism, which is uh, the, the main volcanic platform building phase of activity. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's the kind of, uh, uh, that's, that's the kind of sampling we like to do in order to try to get the most representative uh, uh, composition, both bulk geochemistry and uh, uh, isotopic compositions, in order to understand where these volcanoes came from and what they might uh, be related to, uh, in, on uh, in other parts of the ocean basin potentially. So, yeah, there's very definitely uh, uh, high scientific value out of doing this, and also. I'm a big fan of capturing some interesting structural footage like this because you know if we wanted to try some sort of a uh, like a like a, a photogrammetry exercise and try to render these in 3D, that might give us some additional structural information that we can study later on. Oh, interesting. Yeah, Value that's, that's what I'm kind of hoping to do. Well, I can't necessarily do it myself, but I'm hoping that's one of those things that we can uh, really develop as a kind of neat pro uh, product. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't heard of people doing that for geology basis of Oh, you can photogrammetry it. anything. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, oh, but yeah. I just... Um, but that's interesting. So to me, it's for, like that seems like a way to like get an idea of where where things for relate to each other. So would that be sort of like would that be interest? Like, how, why would that be? A, why would photogrammetry be interesting for you for these particular locations? Um, it's it's not something that I normally uh like specialize in mm -hmm. um so it, it would probably be something like a, that a, a colleague would be uh, uh you know more ideal to work on but mm -hmm. you know that uh with uh, having all of the stuff geolocated you can kind of get an idea for orientation of certain structures within the volcano and try to understand that plumbing system a little oh. bit better and, and try to figure out how this volcano may have grown um i i don't know maybe yeah. it could even give us some uh, insight into uh uh some of the processes, some of these uh, these uh, slumps or failures mm -hmm. that uh, 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 are controlling the morphology of uh, geos like this. So Which, cool that's to kind of an interesting thing. Imagine yeah. like uh, Val's favorite video game, and it would just be like this really cool model of a volcano just growing and evolving over time, and shifting mm -hmm. and changing and collapsing. And uh, photogrammetry could allow us to create some of the visualizations uh, mm -hmm. necessary to sort of make realistic uh you know representations of those environments Which so, i would love to yeah. see in more video games definitely I think what i'm learning is that volcanoes are far more complex than i really understood you know i love the valve oh, they me. have stories to tell <laughs> for for me the sort of pointing back to to things that we've seen on land you know thinking about some of our viewers especially those back on our home island of oahu mm -hmm. Uh, who can who can really sort of imagine that uh, half of that caldera of that volcano kind of slumping off on the mm -hmm. Ko'olau and also on the Waianae side? I believe that the story of the Waianae volcano also is that uh, uh, basically that slid off um, as well, kind of forming those two two main mountain ranges on Oahu. So it's yeah, uh, you can see some evidence for that in the bathymetry. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Oh, and, and I know that a number, not all of our viewers are, are at home on Oahu, but I know that certainly helped me. I, I love it when you oh, describe these processes as uh, kind of their correlates on land, because these are essentially the, very similar to some of the volcanoes that we see in the Hawaiian Islands that are still above the surface of the water as well. So mm -hmm. some similar formations. Thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, go for it. All right, we're about 225 meters to go.
We have a few viewers uh, chiming in, very interested in some of the uh, some of the 3D models. Can uh, you can find some of the models that uh, Nautilus has put up on Sketchfab on their website, their education tab, um, Nautilus Live. Uh, dot org slash education and uh, you can also go into sketchfab and, and search for some of these deep sea structures and deep sea creatures uh, that have been created by other users come with their own references and citations but uh, yeah really uh, really exciting way to be able to explore um, the deep sea over and over again so